welcome back, everybody. Um, we've got a few more things to do today, and our commitment is to get you out the door at 3 o'clock. So hang with us, and we've got some great things between now and then. Um, all right, so what we're going to do now is actually, it's called a strategy for the after lunch slump. <laughs> it doesn't involve jumping jacks or any embarrassing things like that. It does involve some conversations, hopefully somewhat similar to the ones you were just having over lunch. And we're going to spend a little time at your tables. And it's too noisy in here to have a table conversation. So the way we're going to do this is actually have you pull back in groups of two or three from your table and engage in a little conversation. I'll give you some instruction on that in just a sec. So we're going to do that for a little bit. And when we're done with that, we're going to have a panel, a final panel, to help lift up across all of this content we looked at this morning and look at some key thematic areas. So we have some really cool people lined up for that. And then a final moment for the council to ask any questions or just wrap your mind around how this is all going to work over the next few months. And then we're done. OK? So here's our anti-slump uh, strategy. As I mentioned, at your tables, pulling back in groups of two or three, we're going to have you uh, discuss the following questions. All right? You can see them here on the screen. What recommendations are you really fired up about? What is truly exciting and inspiring about the things that you heard about today? Again, you have that handout with the high-level recommendations to remind you that Gail's looking through right now. What was that? Wait, what happened this morning? Right. So what's really inspiring and producing some excitement? The second question we'd like folks to talk about, again, in these groups of two or three, is how do we make sure folks aren't left behind? Right? How do we ensure that a full range of Mainers, particularly those who often may have fewer resources or other barriers to accessing programs, benefits, and the like, um, or have suffered inequities in the current status quo, how does this plan help everyone in Maine? OK, so that's another question to have. And we use this, you've heard this term, priority populations, today. And that's referring to folks who have faced barriers, who have faced inequities, or are at the front lines of some of these changes and have the fewest resources and abilities um, to adapt um, and confront them. The third question is about overarching themes, right? If you don't get to this question, that's fine. However, if you do, it would be interesting to say, I just heard from seven working groups. What are some themes that happened? Right? What are we really hearing about? All right. So here's the plan. I'll put a timer on. I think, what did we say? Uh, 15 minutes for this, max. And I'll give you a little warning. Um, again, groups or two or three work much better than trying to make it at a table because it gets a little noisy in here. So pull back, grab a neighbor or two. Um, have these three conversations. I'll leave these on the screen. Folks online who are joining us, I'm going to put you on uh, the room on mute for a while, and we'll let you know when we come back. Um, but if you're at home or at your office and you want to write down some of these ideas for yourself, that would be great. And by the way, this is a good time to fill out that survey. So maybe some of the go pay for my staff um, that are here could drop in the chat that survey. Um, that Hannah or Melanie showed in the morning. If you wanted to use these 15 minutes to work on that, go for it. OK, so pull back with a neighbor. Here's your questions. We'll do a very cool debrief on the back of this that'll be efficient and interesting. Enjoy. I'll give you a heads up when it's 15 minutes. Thanks, everybody. The way we're going to do a quick debrief of what happened is we're going to try to use a little technology here. Some of you remember from previous Climate Council meetings we've done a little menti. You're going to need your phone. For the first time in this meeting, I'll ask you to please pull out your phones. Um, see this little cute table tent thing that's on your table? On the back of it is a little QR code. 
It is different from the QR code that's on that notes taking template. Don't use that. That's for the survey. We're doing something else that's only here in the room. And I apologize to the folks online. We're just going to do this on the, in the room right now. But um, there's a QR code on the back of this cute little tent thing. And I'll invite all of you to take out your phones and point it at that QR code. If you're not familiar with this for any reason with your phone, what you do is you open up your camera function. You don't take a picture. You just point your camera at it, and then it should pop up and allow you to click on your screen. Turn to your neighbor if you're having a hard time figuring it out on your phone. So we're going to quick get you to um, answer. There's going to be three prompts that we'll do them one at a time. The first one is this first question. Brevity is very helpful in the way you answer this question. So just in a few words or a phrase, what did you talk about, about the things that you're most excited about? OK? If anybody's having trouble, let me know. And once we start to get some answers, uh, we'll start to share those on the screen. Again, turn to your neighbor or find someone under the age of 30 <laughs> to help you out. <laughs> They're all sort of on this side of the room, right? <laughs> OK, so once you finish typing it, what you, what you like to say there, you can look up at the screen and see what other people are saying, right? Check it out. What are we most excited about? Cross laminated timber. Yes. Where did Heather Johnson go? Right, mobile homes, zero energy ready mobile homes, conversation about land usage, reducing food waste, transportation pilots, farmland conservation, reduce VMT, mental health, right? Mental health communications, helping small coastal communities, smart growth. Equity, addition of materials management, talking about retreat in a sensitive way, food systems, food, eat main food. <laughs> I like that one. State food plan, EV transportation, the general intersectional approach across working groups. It's all connected, folks. OK. Eyes wide open, all together, robust recommendations. Wow, lots of thumbs up. I don't even know how to do that. Thanks, everyone, whoever's doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Just feels very celebratory with all those thumbs up going on in the corner there. Improve bus service. OK, there's great stuff. There's 100 and something of you in the room, so I'm not going to read them all. However, we're going to capture these in the meeting summary. And thank you all. It sounds like you had really good conversations about what's inspiring, working waterfront, private sector engagement, active transportation, 100% clean energy. Yes, this is all exciting. Circular economy, source reduction, mental health. We saw a bunch of those. Local food systems. OK, so here, Arti, could you advance to the next question? So our next question is about benefiting priority populations. And think of it also of how do all Mainers participate in a positive way in these issues, in the transition Maine and the country needs to make. So how do we do this in an inclusive way? Great. OK. You can start to see it coming through, right? Other approaches than tax rebates, right? Sliding scale rebates, you know, procedural equity, involve people in the conversations, keep having the conversations, keep people engaged, leverage partnerships and networks, diversified funding strategies, think about basic needs, meet people where they are. Fantastic. Right? There's a lot of good stuff. And this is coming out of the working group recommendations as well. So it's nice to see these echoed. Use the right metrics. Empowered others with informed information. 
right? Make communities livable, walkable, better air quality, earmark funding, involve people in the decision making, right? So you're getting this mix of how do you bring people into this story, right? How do you involve? Some people call that procedural equity. How do you get people involved? And then what are the tools you have at your disposal? There's a lot of good stuff. We're going to capture all this and we'll put this out as part of the summary because I think it's important to not lose this as we go into our next steps. Community benefits agreements, thinking about energy burden. Okay. All of Maine should be a priority on it. Yes. Don't be afraid to tax people calling climate change. All right. Public transit, please. Okay. So let's do one final. And this one final one, we're going to do the output as a word cloud. So brevity is very important here. So one or two words. Um, <clears throat> think about the themes. What, and maybe you talked about this in your smaller groups right now. What thematically was happening to you as you listen, listened to seven groups? Okay. I like, I like watching this thing go. Drop a word in there. I think you can actually do it twice if you wanted to, maybe even three times, I'm not sure. This is great. Wow, intersectionality really has a strong showing today. Okay, you all can see what I'm seeing, right? I'm seeing in addition to intersectionality, we see res uh, resilience, we see education, we see land use, technical assistance, infrastructure, equity, right? Sustainability, housing, adaptation, and there's some lots of good stuff in there too. Federal money. Hope. Hope's making a, an appearance. Okay. All right. Thank you all for that. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate folks engaging your brains, particularly right after lunch like that. And this word cloud is helpful in us making the transition to the next thing we're going to do together. Um, Hannah is going to come up here and help lead our final panel. Um, in this final panel, Hannah will describe, we're trying to go to slightly higher elevation, right? And what, is, what does all this work mean on some big themes for Maine? And I'll, I won't say anything more, Hannah, I'll let you do the introduction. But I'll invite our four panelists, you know who you are, come on up, and I'll let Hannah introduce you all. And there you go. Your names are already on the board. So Hannah, over to you. I'm going to sit down. Yes, I'll sit down in just a sec. Okay. Great. As the panelists come up, I actually just want to take this opportunity to introduce uh, a new Climate Council member that I'm not sure that you've all met. And she's even worn her uniform. Um, so I think as many people know, um, the uh, uh, General um, Farnham retired uh, this past winter and Brigadette Brigad What is the word? Brigadier. Brigadier General Diane Dunn. That are the mental block. That's what happens on stage. Um, she's a fantastic leader with a long history in the military. Uh, most recently came from the University of Maine. So she actually knows everything we're doing and talking about. As many people know, uh, she's the general in charge of Maine's National Guard. She's also in charge of Maine Emergency Management, among many other things. And so we're really honored to have her as a member of the Maine Climate Council. So I think you have to just stand and wave, given you're wearing a uniform. <laughs> Sorry to embarrass her and put her on the spot. I'm more embarrassed myself by not being able to. Uh, anyway, um, so we have uh, an awesome panel here with um, some tremendous leaders who uh, have been involved in Maine's climate plan, uh, actually at the very beginning, who um, are involved with these issues at the local level, um, helping us in state government think about how to actually make all the things we talked about this morning happen. Um, so 
I won't give them each their themes um, because they will very quickly become um, clear who they each are and what they represent. But I think, as many of you know, when we kicked off this Climate Council process, we started talking about um, the importance of resilience. Um, clearly, the storms of December and January really um, hit that home. I think when we started this climate planning process, the ability to implement it, to partner with the federal government, and to come up with the resources we needed to make all this happen um, was unclear. And we've now had a sea change. Um, and one of our speakers really, I think, we're making him represent that sea change for us here today. Um, I will also say that the importance of equity issues, um, thinking about priority populations, public health, intersectionality, as it was just said on the board, um, I think uh, one of our speakers really is a leader in the Climate Council and for the state of Maine doing that work. And then the importance of the economic opportunity and workforce to accomplish this work, accomplish it in a way that creates good paying jobs, um, clearly is something that's come out in many of the recommendations. So I'm gonna quickly introduce our four panelists. Um, we're incredibly lucky to have them. The first one, Sam Dinah, is the Associate Commissioner of the Maine Department of Labor. She leads interagency workforce collaborations, advises on workforce policies, and oversees the deployment of Maine jobs and recovery programs at the Department of Labor. Her recent areas of focus include leveraging federal infrastructure funds to strengthen public workforce systems and expanding apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship opportunities. Uh, prior to working for the state, Sam led strategy development for community foundations and corporate social impact programs. Uh, I would just say she's an incredible collaborator that folks at GoPIF love to work with, so we are very lucky to have her here on this panel and doing this work. Um, next uh, is Linda Nelson, who is the Economic and Community Development Director for the Town of Stonington. She also serves, this is her, her current claim to fame, as the co-chair of the governor's recently launched Commission on Infrastructure Rebuilding and Resilience. As Stonington's Economic and Community Development Director, she's responsible for pursuing grant opportunities, taking the lead in managing various projects going on in town, promoting a diversified and year-round economy in one of the largest fishing communities in the state. Previously, Linda helped found and lead the restoration of the Stonington Opera House and usher in its role as a central community gathering place, and she served in a variety of leadership roles in arts and journalism. Dr. Terry Va, who um, many of you know and have heard from, is the director of Maine's CDC, where she brings broad experience in public health, emergency response, clinical care, and epidemiology. She served as the director of public health in a region of Arizona, serving the population of the Indian Health Service and the Navajo Area Service Unit. She received a medical degree from University of New England, so we are glad she's back here in Maine. She was a chief medical resident at Jacobi Medical Center in the Bronx and served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Burkina Faso. Her journey to the United States as a child alongside her family as refugees from Cambodia adds a valuable dimension to her commitment to public health, humanitarian, and climate equity work. And last, but not least, um, Spencer Thibodeau. He is the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs in the U.S. Department of Energy. He's an attorney in public service. He practiced law in the real estate group in the city of Portland, um, law firm Verrill Dana, for eight years. In addition to his legal practice, Spencer served as a Portland City Councilor for nearly six years where he chaired the Housing and Economic Development Committee and the Sustainable and Transportation Committee. He's a proud graduate of Fairfield University and Northeastern Law, and it doesn't say on his re resume that he was also a former member of the Maine Climate Council <laughs> until he ditched us for Washington, D.C. Um, so with that, we have a, a tremendous panel of people who are really um, doing the work, and I'm going to sit down, but I'm gonna give them each this kickoff question to start out. So most of you are here this morning, you know what was presented. We want you each to talk about what you heard this morning from the working group presentations that really stood out to you as important, either a specific recommendation, a theme, or both. And you can also use it as a chance to reflect on the recommendations as well from your perspective. So I'm actually just, I think it's easiest to go down the line. So Sam Dinah, please kick it off. Great, thanks Hannah. And thanks for having me, and it is an honor to share the stage with such rock stars. I could have just listened to your bios all day long. Um, so in terms of some themes that stood out, I'm here to talk about workforce, if that's not apparent. Uh, three themes really stood out to me that the working groups really hit the nail on the head on. 
Uh, building and expanding the workforce came up in pretty much every working group rep recommendation, diversifying the workforce and making sure that underrepresented communities are connected to economic opportunities and upskilling incumbent workers, um, getting them ready for new technologies and transitions uh, was another theme. Building and expanding the workforce was not a surprising theme. Um, although jobs in Maine are at an all-time high, we've actually added 12,000 jobs since before the pandemic. Unemployment is at record lows, and so we are in a really tight labor market, and employers are feeling that. So that was not surprising to hear. Um, how we can build the workforce is a number of ways, but really thinking about how are we building awareness of these different career opportunities was really cool to see that Climate and Me video. Um, so thinking about how we're building awareness of climate adaptation and resilience careers and circular economy roles, all things that I am still learning about. Um, but how can we br bring those career opportunities not only to young adults, because young adults are already pretty bought in on climate change, they're passionate. So how can we talk about heritage industry roles, construction roles, more traditional roles and thinking about what's the climate change lens of those to get young people fired up and getting into jobs that they might not be thinking about. And then how are we really reaching out to other impacted communities, people with disabilities, people in rural communities, women, people who might not see themselves in these roles and really provide them the opportunity to try something on through a career exploration effort. The other thing that I heard about was creating new jobs, like green jobs and materials management. And this is another way to build the workforce, um, making sure that we're partnering with employers and the industry to create high quality jobs. So when we're thinking about the jobs that are being created, how can we create jobs that can attract workers not only in Maine, but attract workers from out of state because the wages are so good, there's family sustaining benefits, there's childcare, there's a clear pathway to get to that next level in your career, there's an inclusive culture and there's strong opportunities opportunities for worker voice. The next theme was around diversifying the workforce. And a lot of people talked about this in different ways, but really around supporting impacted communities, connecting underrepresented communities to economic opportunities. This is a huge opportunity for Maine. We're getting a lot of federal infrastructure funds in the next couple of years. And so how can we make sure that those funds translate into economic opportunities for individuals that might traditionally be, be left out on the sidelines? Um, we know that people with a disability are three times more likely to be unemployed. People that are in room counties in the rural communities have a twice as high unemployment rate as coastal communities and metropolitan areas. And people of color earn 70% what white Mainers make. So this is really our opportunity to think about how are we creating jobs with the, those individuals in mind. Meeting people where they are, I saw was mentioned, is something that we're really excited about. We've got navigators and career center consultants that are going out and meeting people in recovery centers and reentry centers and shelters. Um, so continuing to build on that work and meeting communities where they are and providing clear opportunities for folks to connect. And also making sure that when we're recruiting folks, we're thinking about the employers that we're sending to job fairs or instructors that are teaching the courses that we're trying to target these communities and how are they reflective of the communities that we're trying to get into the workforce. Uh, what was also mentioned that was really great was wraparound supports. So if we're trying to diversify the workforce and we're thinking about underrepresented communities, they're facing barriers to work um, that are disproportionately higher, such as childcare. So women might be facing childcare uh, barriers that might be higher than men. And Governor Mills just put out an executive order on getting more women in construction. So how can we create supportive work environments for underrepresented communities like women by providing on-site childcare or thinking about subsidized child care. How are we providing transportation? Joyce mentioned this earlier, um, but e-bikes has been really exciting, and uh, we are doing a very small pilot with DOT and the Bangor Area Recovery Network. We're purchasing e-bikes for folks that can't get a license because of their justice involvement or their recovery um, challenges, and we've seen great success. So thinking about how employers can play these roles in overcoming barriers. Mental health was also mentioned, but I'll let Dr. Va talk about that a little bit more. And just thinking about work holistic needs and helping them stay on the job there more than just there to punch in and punch out. They have holistic needs that need to be overcome to stay in the workforce. The last thing I'll talk about is upskilling workers. So we really need new workers in Maine, um, but there's so many workers that are already here. And so as we're thinking about transitioning to EV or other technologies, we don't want to leave those workers behind that have done a really great job for us. And there was a mention of 
expanding apprenticeship, which is a key um, opportunity within the 10-year economic plan. Registered apprenticeship is an earn and learn model. It is proven, it is effective. Um, apprentices are earn double the median salary as when they started their program, so it's really effective for individuals, and workers retain individuals that they're training on the job. 90% of apprentices stay on the job with employers. So how can we upskill workers through proven models that work? And I will stop there. But all good things, and I'm very excited to keep working on the working group recommendations. Over to you. Thank you so much. The first thing I heard today is just how much work everybody in this room and beyond this room has put in so far to these recommendations. And I just want to give a big thank you to you all for your time and your talents and your intensity, because this is something we need to be passionate about. This is urgent. And part of the hat that I wear as the co-chair of the Commission on Infrastructure Rebuilding and Resilience is that this is an urgent, these are urgent issues. So it's great that we can put the time into it and we have to put the pedal to the metal of the accelerator of the EV or whatever kind of transportation it is, but this is an urgent thing. So that's coming from where I come from, which is a local municipality on the coast of Maine, which leads Maine in lobster landings and value of lobster landings year after year. So resilience, not surprisingly, is my theme because what is resilience? So we're really throwing these words around a lot. There were at least three different themes that I want to talk about today where the words we throw around a lot and do we really understand what they mean to us? And resilience is really about adaptation. And I'll tell you that those winter storms that we had, as Carl said, we are in a fight now against the climate, which means that we have blown past mitigation where I live blown past it, because all we can focus on is adaptation. Because what resilience is, is the ability to adapt and get up and do it again. And that's what we're in. You know, pick yourself up, right, I'm a musical person, don't forget, dust yourself off. Well that's, you know, it's nice to say that, but that adaptation that we're in, that is really difficult. And today, you all gave me hope. I think you might have even given my boss, the much aforementioned Kathleen Billings, town manager of Stonington back there. You might have given her a little bit of hope, too. Um, but so if we focus on resilience and we focus on this ability to adapt and to recover, you know, this fight, working waterfronts can't retreat. So there are people that can retreat. So I think it's important that we have retreat up there. But working waterfronts, we can't retreat. Our job, our livelihoods, our culture is at that place where the wall of water comes. And it's not just a wall of water anymore. It's a wall of money from property values. So when we talk about sustaining working waterfront, as we're talking about, we're talking about it for environmental reasons, we're talking about it for climate reasons, we're talking about it for cultural and human issues. And part of that is that if we don't sustain that access for commercial purposes to the waterfront, it gets overtaken by private home ownership. And that would destroy, that does destroy our community. It takes all of that main culture and all of that main heritage and everything that we have fought for and just disappears it. So we have to be able to say the G word of gentrification when we talk about climate change because if we don't focus on the equity piece, that gentrification is real and the people with money are the winners and we can't allow only one portion of our population to win. So, um, so I'm happy to hear about the additional funding. Um, and and I, I wanna say, I mean, you've all heard that analogy of what equity is, right? That if you're trying to see over a fence and you're all different heights, what you need is not the same size box. That's equality, right? Everybody gets the same size box, but you need different size boxes so that you can all see over the fence no matter how tall you are. That's equity. 
So when we think about our small communities and our large communities, our rural communities and our urban communities, we have to really think about equity and how that functions in our implementation. You know, do we have to have a one-to-one -one match for all this money coming out? Do small communities have to have the same match as large communities have to have? Those are the kinds of questions, like on the ground questions, the practical implementation questions around equity, I think we really need to ask. Because I know for a fact that our community, we can't afford a one-to-one -one match for all the money we need to bring in, to raise all the roads, to bring up all the infrastructure. So we need those equitable funding mechanisms that we heard about. But the thing I think I'm most excited about is, as you said, is about intersectionality. Because that's what we haven't had. We haven't had that collaboration across all the disciplines. And I'll tell you something, when you work at the local level, you know that as a fact. Because every day, it's like playing a piano. If you don't have all 10 fingers moving on education, economy, infrastructure, working waterfront, all these different things at once, you don't have, the, you don't have anything happening. And it's not easy to be a 10-fingered piano player. There's some people in the room, I'm sure, who are really, really good at it. I'm not. But we're all trying to pull the strings at the same time. So to think that the state is thinking the same way across these sections, right? Across the environment and the environmental controls, across the infrastructure rebuild, across the financing, across the education, that's where we totally need that support in our small communities because it's really hard for one and a half people to take attention to all those things all the time. So that's a really important thing that we heard. A lot of other great stuff too, the materials management, thank you for bringing that on, is a huge issue in our coastal communities. We're remote. All that material, if we're wasting it, it's gotta get trucked far, far away, and then what happens to it? Ours is going to a landfill two hours away right now, a landfill that's about to be filled up. And PERC and the other plants that exist, they're not functioning. So that waste to energy thing, it's not functioning. So we need that materials management, thank you so much. If we can reduce food loss and waste by 50% by 2030, hallelujah everybody. We should all just stand up and give praise if we can do that, that is huge. So thank you for having that as a goal. And the phrase good growth strategies or climate strategies, I think it's something as local municipal people, we really need to keep that in mind. And again, to have the backing of the state as we do these things is super important because we just don't have the resources. So for us, the state functions not just as a funding mechanism and not just as a permitting mechanism, not just as a regulatory mechanism, but sometimes you function like our office. Right, <laughs> because we don't have enough people, so we have to rely on our partnerships with you. And if we're not all on the same page and we're working in different directions, then that's when it gets really hard. And that's part of the, one of the things I wanna say, you know, we didn't hear a lot today about, you know, I live on a bridged island. So our favorite thing and the thing we spend most of our time on, bridges, causeways, culverts, and roads, because a lot of those things are under local control. Some of them are under state control, but a lot of them are under local control. Again, we can't do it ourselves. And I now see the gap that the Commission on Infrastructure Rebuilding and Resilience is filling because we didn't hear a lot about those key components of our infrastructure today. And we're gonna really need to. And I wanna conclude my remarks by just saying something about education. The word education was on the screen in almost every one of the working group's recommendations. It's not enough to just educate people about climate change. I think part of the intersectionality we're talking about has to involve the Department of Education. And I'd love to see them in the room and I'd love to see them at the table. Because without the university system and without public education and without working with kids about food security, about climate, about energy, about all these topics, intersectionality that we're talking about, without talking about that with them when they're in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, and those kids that are in the public schools who are some of our most priority populations, then we are not really doing education. 
So if we're gonna talk about education, we have to talk about our public schools because that's where our priority populations are. And I will leave it at that and pass it on to Dr. Pa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Is this on? Yes. I think, oh, thank you. Um, so as Hannah eloquently described, you know, my, my background is, of course, in public health and health, um, but I have a strong interest in equity. And what I heard today, one, a few comments, actually, in terms of, like, what I heard and just through observations, I just want to thank everybody for the degree of work that was put into all of this. You know, when I first started sitting on this climate council, I was very new, and I didn't understand, like, just the detail and intricacy and all the time, effort, discussions that the leads and each of the work groups, like y'all really did a lot of work and that comes through in the recommendations. You know, I started thinking in adjectives, right? You know, like what do I think of these recommendations? I thought they were thoughtful, intentional. Um, I thought it clearly showed a commitment to the future, right? And I think the theme of the day maybe is indeed intersections, right? Intersectionability. Um, so I just want to, you know, recognize, like, thank you for all that level of work and just the lift that is in front of us. But a lot of that lift has already been done. Um, you know, in my work, looking at this through health and equity, and sometimes the two do converge in terms of like what I noticed was it's interesting. I, you know, I see federal discussions, I see regional discussions, I see state discussions surrounding public health, lessons learned from COVID, what can we do to be better? But then I start to see a convergence of ideas and I see it here too. So there's all these different discussions that are happening at these different levels among different work groups, but there really is a convergence of ideas here. The framework and the recommendations that were put out today, what I heard, right, with that public health hat on was, I hear social determinants of health, right? Oftentimes in public health, we convene people, not, not dissimilar to what's happening here. And a lot of these things that we have to think about is the ecosystem of health and how this impacts individuals, and then how does it impact population health? And oftentimes, those intersections and in that the, the ecosystem itself is beyond our, not our control, but to some degree, it's not within our space. We have to always work with partners to be able to make things happen because we don't control all of that alone. To what you said, we can't do this alone. And that happens in many different ways, you know, whether it's climate, extreme climate, or whether it's a pandemic, right? Um, and so that's what I heard. I was like, okay, there's this ecosystem of health, and it's so cool to hear all these different folks put out these recommendations that we talk about all the time in public health, but are like, okay, who do I need to talk to to help me you know, reach that conclusion to help with that lift because I can't do it alone as a public health entity. Um, what I heard, you know, like how do we, understanding the landscape, including the funding landscape, and everybody's different roles at the different levels, state, region, local, I heard local control, right? Um, and then the different backgrounds, whether it's through the environment or is through like the Marine Coastal Working Group or community resilience. What I hear is, well, how do we work together to center around health outcomes? Like, so how do you do this work? How do you make this happen, right? Is if we think about the outcomes itself, whether, you know, health outcomes, and we think about quality of life and the impact on the individual and then draw that out to the population, you know, if we think of that, and center it around equity and health outcomes and disparities, really. Now pull it out and work backwards. We'll figure out, well, what are those determinants of health? What are those drivers of health at that individual level and at the population level? And how will our strategies and recommendations impact that? This is how I saw it in terms of like how we center this around human health, public health, and health disparities and how we built in equity in the work that we do is to draw it back, centering on health outcomes and disparities and then work backwards. I do think as a member of the Climate Council, one of our goals, what I'm hearing, is that's gonna be our job is to think about, well, now these are the policy recommendations once we start prioritizing. Well, how do you connect it with data? And oftentimes those data systems already exist we just have to work with our folks and our partners to figure out who's collecting what information and where and how and how do we connect them, right? 
So how do we connect the policies to data to inform the way we move forward? And how does that go back? Like, how does that impact the, those determinants and drivers of health? And how does that ultimately impact health outcomes? And did we do, did we level the playing field in terms of, you know, creating equity in the policies that we are implementing? I, I do see that as a, a role for us as a climate council member. Um, the other thing I want to talk about too is very, very pulling it even more, a little bit out. I talked about public health, health, and you know how to center like work in disparities and equity. What I hear too is that one of our goals will likely figure out a lot of good dis discussions have been had. So how do we carry this work forward, even outside of the the role and responsibility of a work group, right? Because we know our work is not done. Um, so how do we support those groups that are already having this meaningful meaningful discussion so that they can continue to work and have that level of discussion? In addition to that, what I heard was how do we, you know, how do we how do we build an equity at the policy level and then at the implementation level? There's several different things that are heard in terms of equity. I heard well, how do you use funding streams to support equity? Well, we have a whole room of different stakeholders and everybody has a strength, right? Whether this is the federal funding landscape, regional funding landscape, you know, whatever it is, you know, we can coordinate our work together and maybe that's what the Climate Council can help assist with is who needs to do what to achieve a collective goal, right? Um, I heard the need for flexibility, for being nimble, and how do you do that in our existing funding landscape? It's just that, like I may, as a state, as a you know, main CDC, I may not be best positioned to apply for a certain grant, but maybe my academic partner would be, or maybe my local community partner will be because they are the most nimble and they understand the community members way better than I could. And so how do we actually start working together to achieve that? I think that's really important because there is indeed a need for administrative response, making sure that we are flexible in our funding, and then making sure that the funding gets down to the folks that are delivering that level of care. Um, I do think that will help with some of these equity questions that are happening. There's also, I heard, equity in the workforce, equity, how are we more inclusive? I think when we talk about policies and we draft them, well, how do we start building that language in to consider I, mean, I can consider anything, right? <laughs> but will I actually put it into practice? Or how do you make that into muscle memory? Well, then build it into that language, right? Build the language into those policies so that you don't have to just consider. It's already there. It's in the system itself. Um, but then equity in terms of implementation, and I heard this in different work groups, not necessarily always today, but just talking to the different work groups. And I think this is something to consider. You know, as we think about the different levels we play, or whatever roles we play at the different levels, you know, down at the community level, it's probably the most impactful because that's where action really happens, right? Um, we create policy, but the person at the delivering it is at the community level. So when we think about that, who are we supporting in terms of equity? Are we supporting the communities being served, the population being served, those that with the disparity? But could we also think about the organizations that are delivering these services? How do we build the community up, right? Supporting both the organization at the community level from the community themselves who are delivering this to those on the ground. And I say that because what we learned in public health is oftentimes that message and the messenger is really key. We can consider, we can talk about policy, we can talk about strategy, we can talk about program implementation, but from the discussions I heard, sometimes it's hard to change that into action, right? And then if people don't, if the public is not with you and they're not, they're not, they don't buy into this, you can ask them to leave that home. And I heard someone give this as an example. You can ask them to leave that home because it's flooding and they still won't leave that home. So how do you, how do you create those relationships so that the messenger is a trusted entity and that person would be compelled to act? I think that's gonna be really challenging, but it's actually quite doable. Ending on a message note. I do think it's important as we start to message this because in what we've learned is there's a sense of collective trauma, the sense of the acute disaster itself, but then there's this ongoing level of stress that a population can feel. And at the individual level, it also translates. 
But what I hear today is this, this thought, there's, there's hope here, right? The reason why we were doing this is because we are indeed committed to the future. So how do we, through education, through, through you know, messages, how do we start, how do we message that in a way that, you know what, it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. The fact that we're doing something means something, and that there's hope in our actions themselves. I know I will be taking that lesson back to Maine CDC to figure out how we can do more in terms of messaging. You know, how do we do this with the media? How do we build this into marketing even? How we market this message? How do we work with our partners that are talking about, you know, talking about extreme climate um, as we you know, talk about extreme heat, for example, this week? Right? Like, how do we do this in a way like, you know, this is hopeful. There's things that we can do is actionable and then compel people to act with us. And I'll just end on that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm, I always take an excuse to come home to Maine. And when, when Hannah told me that we were doing this, I didn't know we were doing it at the Augusta Civic Center, which I actually love. So I'm glad to be uh, back in Augusta. Um, I had the opportunity to um, listen to some of the uh, discussion earlier this morning. Um, some of the themes that uh, took place, uh, took center stage for me were um, kind of the local impacts, the uh, access and connectivity, but I think the one that stood out the most was um, in a discussion of heat pumps, and it had to do with performance and kind of does the technology work, and I believe the individual said that people are seeing, you know, even in some of the coldest years that this is working. Um, and I think that uh, theme is applicable to what we're doing at the federal government as well. Um, when we started this journey, uh, when I was on the uh, Climate Council back in the day, um, the two bills, Uncle Bill and Uncle Ira, didn't exist yet. Uh, we weren't investing $100 billion in the Department of Energy, which was at one time an inward-facing agency, uh, but now uh, has money uh, to uh, dole out all over the country, which is why uh, the president chose Secretary Granholm, who was a governor in Michigan, to be out on the road uh, pitching um, kind of, does it work? Is, are these investments working? And so before I came up, I actually had my team pull a couple numbers, and uh, you can tell me if it's working. Um, of that $100 billion that's been invested or in the process of being invested across the 50 states and territories, um, what's germinated from that were, in, were a number of investments. On the battery side, um, there's been, since the president took office, $120 billion in investments and battery uh, facilities. And that also includes over 250 new facilities or expanded facilities to meet the demand for batteries. On the EV side, you guys talked a little bit about EVs, $40 billion announced in investments across the country. Uh, and that's 150 new uh, factories or facilities or expanded facilities. Um, Offshore wind investments, $7.3 billion invested. Um, and that's 17 manufacturing facilities, 15 ports, and a substation already. Um, on the solar side, some of you are interested in solar, 17 billion announced, 120 new or expanded facilities. Um, what does this tell us? It tells us that uh, what we're doing is working. But uh, as we look at the forest, you all are kind of looking at each individual tree. Um, and so as we're asking ourselves, is it working, are we making those dollars accessible? And part of what my job is to do is to make sure we're making it accessible, but we're also telling the story of what those investments mean. That's jobs in Michigan, right? That's jobs in Maine. That's jobs in California. Um, and when I ask myself uh, this question every single morning, uh, where am I? Because I feel like uh, I don't oftentimes know which time zone I'm in. Um, but where's the secretary today? Who's she talking to? And so performance is showing up into somebody's home who's just uh, gone through a weatherization program for a state and finding out they saved $1,000 a year on their electricity bill. It works, right? I don't need to convince any of you whether it works, right? But Uncle Larry or Aunt Jane, when you're talking to them and they don't have a heat pump, they've never interacted with one in their whole life, all they know is that truck that shows up that puts the hose into their house and drops the oil there and, and it, heats the, it heats the water, right? Or it helps uh, you know, uh, fire up the radiator when it's cold. But what about that button on that control that looks a little scary that maybe we don't exactly know how to use quite yet? Um, 
but it's more efficient, it saves you money. So um, as we are going across the country telling our stories uh, about how these dollars are impacting people, um, and this is in every single state, I might add, too. Um, this doesn't, you know, jobs are universal, right? You want to you see that factory come back to life in your community if you're in the Midwest or you're in the Northeast, right? A state, that, a state that's already taken a ton of um, uh, action like you all are doing and a state that hasn't taken much action. They still want federal funds to invest in their communities, right? It's universal. Um, I'll just kind of close with, because uh, I know we want to get to one or two more questions, um, but I, I think um, when we look out how we've used $100 billion, my, my challenge to each one of you is, uh, one, are the communities that maybe don't know about any of this funding, are they missing some sort of technical assistance? Can you help them? Can this group make it easier for them to access dollars? And then two, um, I think, is just the feedback loop. Uh, some of the folks in this room I've talked with quite often about some of our programs and whether they're actually working uh, and whether they're actually, the money's getting to where it needs to, to get fast enough. And as part of that um, is taking a local approach to uh, federal programs. And that means right-sizing it for you. If, if we are making you jump through a number of hoops um, to get this federal funding, we aren't doing our jobs because it's not going out fast enough. So my hope is you'll continue to give us feedback as a department because uh, as, as some folks may be able to attest in this room, it actually does work. We listen. So kick it back to you. Great. Well, I'm looking at David. We're already a little close to time, but we have Spencer here. I'm just going to ask him a couple more questions since we all need to know how to not miss this opportunity. I actually, just while you're here, Spencer, the rest of these folks will be with us throughout our climate council process in some way or the other. But honestly, the people of Maine, Maine community, state government is trying to figure out how to not miss this opportunity. The Department of Energy manages a lot of these programs. EPA manages some of these programs, USDOT. Can you just give us a little advice when you sort of think about the climate plan? H how do we not miss this time period in which so much opportunity is possible in partnership with the federal government? Yeah, I'd say um, I talk to a number of, uh, when I get to travel to different states, I get to talk to a number of folks at different levels of government, whether it's the state or kind of the, the smaller municipalities. And I think what's most important is, one, have centralizing somebody who can actually track federal opportunities. Like, that is 100% key. Um, each one of you can't go to energy.gov, although you should, uh, can't go to energy.gov every single day. Uh, but that's where the announcements are coming, coming out, right? That's where those kind of small 50, 30, small 50 million, $37 million opportunities are, are going to be located, right? So if, if there's some way that, uh, that folks can band together and think not just like regionally of, as, as a state, but actually as an overall state, which you're kind of doing uh, at the moment, that is gonna be key for each one of you. I'd also say is understanding how federal agencies work is super important. When I got to Washington DC uh, three years ago, uh, I stood at the front doors of this building that was an entrance into a bureaucracy of 125,000 employees at the Department of Energy alone. And of one, as one of 88 political appointees, uh, that was a daunting task. Alone, as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Department of Energy has set up 70 programs uh, for, for all of this funding uh, to, move these, to move this funding out that did not exist before. We are 100% uh, implemented at this point, and now the dollars are being pushed out the door. That's at the department alone. We haven't even gotten to the Department of Transportation or the Department of Labor um, or EPA. And so if you can try to figure out a way to centralize that or to work with your municipal associations to try to make sure that you're not missing these opportunities, I promise you it will pay dividends for you. One last thing, because I would be remiss if I didn't say this. If you live in a community that is planning to invest in clean energy projects, 100% you should know about what we call direct pay or elective pay. If you don't know about that yet, that is essentially a one-third match for at the federal level um, for clean energy projects, direct pay. Google it, uh, find, go watch, I think there's a two minute video. It is astonishing. When, when I was on the city council in Portland, if we got a third of the project funded from the state, 
we were extremely happy and, and, and it made a huge difference. And so as your communities are planning and budgeting, make sure you're thinking through whether you can uh, take advantage of that one, essentially one third match for clean energy investments. And that's buildings, that's clean energy infrastructure. Keep that in mind. I cannot leave without Who saying Who is that. eligible for direct pay? A great question, all right? I'm not a tax attorney. Although I am a country lawyer, I used to be. Um, but I will just say, if you are a, a, a charitable org organization, if you are a municipality, locality, um, if you're otherwise organized in, in a similar fashion, there actually is an outline of who qualifies online. Uh, you are you are eligible for that. So just check check online <laughs> if you if you think if you think you might qualify, if you think you fit in any of those, uh, you probably do. So take a look at that. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm about to get the, the David hook. You're allowed to have a little break. But I'm going to ask each panelist to challenge themselves to two sentences, and I'll start at the other end. Um, what Climate Council strategy are you most excited to see implemented? And you can, I'm not, maybe whoever wants to jump out. Does anybody have a strategy they heard about this morning they are most excited to see it implemented? This is supposed to be advice, but that would take too long, so. I have one. Yes. This is not even within my purview, and I was sharing this with my team over there. It's actually the one where it was like, decrease sprawl and create and support at the community level community centers. The reason for that is because we recognized, in terms of like public health impacts, is that it helps with connectedness, and we know connectedness improves health outcomes for people across the generations and across the lifespan. And if we can make that happen and I can support it in any way, I am excited about seeing that happen. Excellent. If we can put together the land use and the funding and the um, regulations to sustain our working waterfronts and commercial access, we'll be doing this state a huge favor, and I'm excited about that continued effort. Thank you. Okay, mine is very boring, but somebody said support state workforce initiatives, and I really would encourage everyone to just connect to workforce initiatives that are already happening. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We are a small state. We are working together. There are things that are working out there, like apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship. There are career centers in your communities, and there's federal funding that already exists. So support state workforce initiatives. Plug into what's already happening. We don't need to start from scratch, and we can hit the ground running really quickly. I think mine, uh, uh, I got to come to Maine and what was that? Was that February? A lot. When, when was I here last for the I know, EV? I, EV. <laughs> February? Was it winter. February? It was February. Wow. Um, it, was, it was warm out, though. It was, it was warm. Um, when I was here for, uh, to, to kind of help open up the, um, the fast charger at the Rockland Hannies, if you know, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, I would just say the kind of acceleration of uh, an electrification of vehicles, I think, is super exciting and just like keep going. I saw that announcement earlier this week about um, kind of the expansion of those chargers. So it's just, it's awesome. Keep up the good work. Keep going. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank Spencer for spending more time in Maine. I'm sure it was very hard for him. And our awesome panel, all of whom will be with us in our climate council process in one way or the other. Uh, we're very lucky to have all four of them. So thank you all very much. This is an opportunity just to close things out. Climate council members, you're about to embark on a journey, much like you did in 2020, to make sense of all this content, bring it together into a coherent update of Maine Won't Wait. Luckily, you have Hannah Pingree's office and other folks in state government helping you do that. Here's a slide that has a few things that are going to happen over the next uh, few months that are very relevant for your work as a council. The survey, which uh, has been mentioned, and we'll put it up in the slides one more time, um, is going to be a pathway to get folks input, a variety of people across the state. It is not a sort of statistically uh, rigorous survey, but it's more an opportunity for folks to provide input. That will be happening. There also will be some in-person events uh, as Hannah mentioned, uh, GoPIF will be going on the road sometime late in the summer into the early fall to talk to Mainers across the state. Also, the folks at the Mitchell Center, University of Maine, 
we'll be doing additional rounds of focus groups and conversations with a range of Mainers across the state, particularly folks who don't typically come into a room like this and participate in these kinds of processes. So that's the extraordinary value of this process. And I, I want to say a hats off to Hannah Pingree's office, GoPIF, for investing in that work um, for the Mitchell Center because when you bring people's voices into the conversation who aren't typically part of the conversation, you'll get a much wiser outcome. So you'll get more of that. And so when you meet back in September, you'll have an additional round of input from a variety of Mainers. Also, there's going to be a significant effort around modeling. So an RFP is out to um, and maybe even awarded um, for a consultant group to rerun um, those analyses to understand how economy-wide Maine can be on a pathway to meeting its statutory emissions reductions. That modeling will happen over the summer and into the fall, and those results will help you all settle on some of the targets that might be part of Maine Won't Wait version 2. Um, so stay tuned for that modeling, but that will be uh, allowing you all to have a coherent uh, storyline uh, coherent with uh, main statutory obligations um, and a, an economy-wide look at what's needed for emissions reductions. And also a cost-benefit analysis to know how to do that in a cost-effective way. Um, finally, your job as a council with support is to pull it together, right? This word integrate. Um, and I don't think it has a name yet. Maybe it does, Hannah or, or Tony has a name like Maine still won't wait, or I don't know. Maybe yeah, maybe we'll do a little competition for a good name. 2.0. Reloaded. I mean, we'll pull from Hollywood. They, they always didn't. Okay, so that's our job. Here's what we're, how we're going to do it. Um, there's three meetings, and this actually takes my breath away a little bit to say how you as a group of nearly 40 or perhaps roughly 40 individuals on the council We'll use three meetings, half of which will be, or, or two thirds of which will be on Zoom, um, to build alignment around a thoughtful update. So think about what that means. It means a commitment on your part as a council to be very present um, and to do your homework and look at all those inputs that I was on that previous slide that are gonna come out over the summer into the fall um, and come prepared to say, this feels meaningful or this you know, I'm very uncomfortable with this, or this could be a lot better if we did it this way. That's the kind of conversation we're going to be having in September, October, and into November. Well, this is not due officially until December 1st. It turns out December 1st is like the day after Thanksgiving or something like that. So we're going to try to finish this up before Thanksgiving and have agreement on the plan. Okay. This was going to be an opportunity, if we have Brian or others with mics, um, to do a quick um, check in with counselors about any doubts you had, any questions you had about the pathway ahead and what's being asked of you. The ball is now going to be in your court. Um, the working groups carried it this far um, and gave you an enormous amount of material to work with. GoPIF, Hannah Pingree's office, is going to prep you up to have really meaningful conversations. And it's going to be your climate action plan at the end of the day that you tried to reach some agreement on. So quick, I've got two mics here. Any questions from climate counselors about this pathway, what's going to be asked of you over the coming months, how we're going to get to the finish line, things that aren't clear. Anything folks want to ask? Don't be shy. Things that still perhaps aren't clear to me either. Anything, counselors, crystal clear? Yeah, nodding heads, fantastic. It could be yes, and I'm ready to go. Yeah, okay. All right, well, come find me or Hannah or Melanie um, if you have any questions. There's one last thing I want to do before we go. And you know I'm a big believer in uh, memory crutches. If some of you use that note-taking template, great, or if you have your own way of doing it. Before we go, I want you on that template or on your phone or wherever you take your notes to just write down something that you absolutely do not want to forget when we show up on September 25th and we're starting to talk about this. So just take a moment, counselors, and anybody else who's here who's going to be part of this story as we go forward, what's something you absolutely do not want to forget when we gather again 
several months from now. Write that down for yourself, not for me, but for yourself in some place where you will have it. Take a moment. I'll just, we'll just be quiet for a moment here while you do that. Folks online, feel free to write something down for yourselves as well. Okay, I do want to just give a pause here to say, would anybody like to share what they just wrote down? Because we do have these mics right now. This won't take long, but do you want to just share, somebody wants to share something that they just wrote down, something you don't want to forget? Counselors in particular, we'll start here. Noel. Noel in the back, yes, Noel's in the back, yeah, please. And Noel, go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Is this working? There it is. All right, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Noel Bonham. I'm with ARP Maine. I'm a member of the Climate Council, also the equity leadership team on the council. Um, and um, thank you, everyone, for the amazing work that you've done. And thank you. That's a lot of work for us now. Uh, but no, just kidding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing that I wrote for notes is I think a lot of the work that we're talking that came up today and all the work that we're doing is so much about preaching to the choir. And I think the big piece, the elephant in the room, is how do we really engage folks? Like Joy said earlier, like we all agree about that climate is changing, but if don't, everyone doesn't believe in it. It's, it's th that piece is missing in this work. And when we come back, I'm hoping we explore that and really dig deeper into it to see how we can build bridges and kind of really do this work in a way that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about. Thanks, Noel. Yeah. Other th thoughts, folks, things that folks wrote down? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Oh, we have someone in the back. Yeah, Kathleen. Yes, again, thank you all. Hang on one second. I'm going to grab a mic so folks online can also hear you. Give me one second. Here it comes through a sea of tables. Poor girl, I got to run in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for all the hard work. Um, one, a couple of the things that I've been thinking about a lot, um, we mentioned about housing. We have a terrible gentrification problem that's going on with houses being bought up. Uh, Miss and middle can't afford the housing. They're not eligible for the other housing. You know, the state really needs to have some deep conversations and also the legislature too. You know, what is the future of the state going to be with that? Also, too, I mean, I can't uh, stress enough, you know, we need our roads and bridges. I mean, the state's transportation budget used to be between 30 and 40 percent years ago. That's eroded down to half of that or more. Joyce could probably press that out. But all of this stuff is not going to matter because if we can't roll back and forth on the roads or bridges, we're not going to get anywhere else. Thanks. Thank you. Other reflections from folks? You, something you really don't want to forget. Over here. Uh, one of the... Hang on just one second. Folks could introduce themselves. Hi, Chris. I'm uh, Chris Kessler. Um, one thing that stuck out to me uh, was around the community uh, resilience piece and uh, needing funding uh, to help communities prepare for that. And that intersected with our working group with buildings in, in that uh, we are needing to help a lot of households make repairs and prepare for flooding to fix the leaky roofs. Um, and so there's that intersectionality there that I really want to build on. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. One more, if there's another one out there. Don't be shy, folks. Don't be shy. I see a hand on this back table. Yep. Got some of our youth reps here. Go Maine. Okay, yeah, hi, my name is Kate Rice. Um, and I think going into this next phase, um, it's important for us all to remember why we're here. And um, so I don't wanna forget like why I choose to be here, why you all choose to be here and yeah. That's 
Thank you. That's right. Right. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Why don't we call it here? Um, I want to just say this was a lot of effort to make um, this meeting happen. Uh, there's a lot of thanks been given already. I want to do a particular uh, shout out to Molly Siegel in uh, Hannah Pingree's office. A, a round of applause for. and the entire GoPIF team and the Consensus Building Institute team and everyone. And, and my biggest thanks go to all of you coming to a meeting like this or tuning in online and being part of this story. Maine really does lead in the sort of engagement it has around this, so thank you all. Um, we'll see you on Zoom uh, in September and stay tuned to your emails about the kinds of activities that you can get involved in over the summer into the fall, uh, the kinds of engagement activities where counselors are very encouraged to come and, and be part of it. So see you all. Um, careful of the heat out there. There's, I think the climate's changing. I don't know about you guys, but all right. We'll see you around the next meetings. Take care, everyone.